Hey everybody, Mike Giardina here with CrossFit Health at the Symposium for Metabolic Health. I'm here with Peter Ballasted, also known as... Don Pedro, the sod father of the Ruminati. I love it, I love it. And uh, well, you're here, we're at this conference. Can you tell me a little bit about what you plan on talking or what your presentation is gonna be about here at, at um, the Symposium for Metabolic Health? Sure. Uh, the title is Metabolic Health and Sustainability. And I even put quotes around the word sustainability because it doesn't always mean what people engaged in that work mean by the word. So it's one of those times when like heart healthy, yeah. you can say that and people will think they know what you mean, but you kind of have to dig another layer in. Interesting. And how, how does that apply? So give me an example of that. Like I can, I can think of some examples of that with Heart Healthy due to marketing and advertising and those types of things. How does that apply with something like sustainability? Where do, where do you see that disconnection happen? When we oversimplify, oversimplify the various factors that go into legitimate conversations about sustainability. And when people are talking sustainability, is it, were we talking specifically in like an environmental sense or um, how, give me a, a good, if you could, if you can, uh, definition, description of what you mean by sustainability. Well, sustainability is, as the name implies, being able to continue something mm -hmm. for a period of time but the, the people that I learn from say that we have to be concerned about three primary factors, others add more, but basically we need to be concerned about social issues. Mm -hmm. We need to be concerned about environmental issues. Uh, we need to be concerned about social issues, economic issues, as well as environmental issues. Okay. And too often the conversation only focuses on environmental. Right. And then even within that, it only looks at anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Right, right, right. And typically that's misrepresented as cow farts. Right. <laughs> when that's yes, not I, even- I would say that is definitely a misrepresentation. <laughs> that's what you hear of, absolutely. And when that's not even right because it's burps. <laughs> okay. So we've, you're I welcome. Mean, yes, I'm learning. I've already <laughs> learned so much in this short time that we've been talking. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about that. And maybe specifically, we'll, we'll direct this conversation into um, the environment and maybe even dig a little bit deeper in something like climate change. And what I love to, to um, discuss with you is, is, or are these recommendations for avoiding animal-based products, right? So whether it be meats or eggs or dairies or those types of things. And um, and instead of eating those, eat more plant-based alternatives. Mm -hmm. And how that is supposedly better for the climate and, uh, and, and supposedly uh, has the ability to improve climate change. What are your thoughts on that recommendation, that approach? Yeah, I don't think that's well-founded, and I don't think it's true. Uh, for one, we can say that humanity's diet is already plant-based. Now, we need to understand that plant-based can be a code word for vegan. <laughs> okay. okay. And, and so it's a way that's maybe more acceptable in the marketplace. Yep. Um, I think that some amount of animal source foods are essential for human development and flourishing. Yep. And I think the evidence will support that. Um, then it becomes a personal thing of what your choices are. Um, the, there have been estimates made of if we were to remove animal agriculture from the United States, yep. that we would reduce anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in the United States by somewhere around two and a half percent. Okay. And globally, that would be less than half a percent impact. Interesting. And, and yet on the negative side of that would be imbalancing our food system mm -hmm. 
as well as they said creating, I would say, exacerbating essential nutrient deficiencies. So that seems a pretty steep price to pay for something that's probably within the margin of error of any estimate. That was going to be my question. So you, so you, you said two and up to two and a half percent within the United States. Yes. Less than half a percent globally. Yes. What actual impact is that? Like, what are we talking here in terms of what, what would we expect to notice from? Let's say it was, let's say error, error excluded. We yeah. actually got two and a half percent improvement mm -hmm. in the United States. What are we, what are, what are yeah, going to be the economic? Yeah, it would not be measurable by, or noticeable by people <laughs> in terms of temperature change, assuming all of the assumptions that go into that. Um, so it is a meaningless, from that sense, number. Now, at the same time, all of beef in the United States is 2% of anthropogenic greenhouse gases in the United States. All of animal agriculture is 4% of total. So beef is half, and, and that's because of ruminants and what they do. Um, all of agriculture is somewhere around 10. So we're seeing that animal agriculture is a little less than half. So we're going to remove that source of food production, which means we've got to replace it with more plant source. Yeah, yeah. we're getting there. And, and it's not a one-for-one one swap, is it? Because animal source foods are more valuable than plant source foods. So to make up for it, we need to eat more of those to make up. And, and on and on and on this goes. At the same time, within the United States, we have estimates of sources and sinks that's put out by the EPA. And already today, it's estimated by them that land use sequesters an amount of CO2 equivalent to 12% of total emissions. So let's go back and look at that. We are already sequestering more than what agriculture today is credited with emitting. Now, some caveats in there. Land use includes forestry. Okay, so those two combined. Now, if we take a step back and look at, if we're grazing animals on pastures, then we're not tilling the soil, we're sequestering more carbon in there than we do when we produce tilled crops. So now if we shift away, convert more of those grasslands, which are already the most endangered ecosystem in North America, if we're gonna take yet more of those out to produce more soybeans, more corn, more whatever, then that's going to lower that 12% sequestered figure. So again, these are complicated issues that get oversimplified in the soundbite advocacy space. So then what's behind it? How, how, why is that message so strong? Is it, is it when the, the proposed results are so minimal, where is it coming from and how has it gained so much traction and why is it continuously pushed for? Well, uh, many layers. There are a lot of layers. Yeah. Um, one person put it to me this way. When, <clears throat> when you begin to heal, you become more aware. And one of those awarenesses is this sense of, you know, concern for the environment, which is legitimate. Um, but if you couple that with bad information, then, you know, it's, you become susceptible to misinformation and you then communicate that. On the other side, there are people whose livelihood depends on promoting this other message. Now, one could look at me and say, well, you're from animal agriculture. So 
And, and so my only answer is to say, well, here's the studies, here's the information, let's explain this, let's explore this and see if what I'm saying makes more sense than what we've been hearing. And, and I could well be wrong. You know, and one, one comment I've heard is if an honest man is shown to be in error, he either ceases to be in error or he ceases to be honest. <laughs> That's a great quote. Uh. And yeah, let me post that on my own mirror, right? On the other hand, w one of the messages I want people to know is that when they improve their health, they are improving the world. And they're doing that in a number of ways. And, and the environmental impact, which again is this nebulous kind of maybe, maybe not, feels good, hard to quantify. But the healthcare industry has an environmental footprint. For sure, of course. And the pharmaceutical industry has an environmental impact. And I can pull out the one estimate that says the US healthcare industry is responsible for 10% of the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Now, I've cited some figures from EPA and now I've just cited these, and it's fair to say that those are not an apples to apples comparison. My point would be it's a significant impact. And if we had a way to lower that, that should be considered in the conversation. <clears throat> Somebody else, did the assessment of the intensity of emissions from pharmaceutical industry. And from that, somebody else said, well, let's do the calculation. And they came up with the estimate that said, if the average adult American with type 2 diabetes could eliminate their medication use, they would reduce their carbon footprint 29% more than if they shifted from a high meat to a vegan diet. Huh. Wow. Now, that's interesting. So and, and so that leads to something you were you were telling me prior to this and we had a we had a small conversation, short conversation prior to the interview. And you're seeing one of the messages you wanted were, was for people to focus on their own metabolic health. It's, and and if we can get everyone to focus on their own metabolic health then there's this larger impact than trying to think about the larger impact first. Is that, right. is that right. sum it up to some extent? Right. One should always, I don't know. There was the quote about people who are most, you know, vociferous about saving the world. Yes. And usually there's something behind that. Right. My version of that is that people who are, speak the loudest about changing the world. Right are doing it to keep themselves from doing the hard work of changing themselves. Interesting. I gotcha. mean, that's, that's humbling work. It takes effort and commitment. The irony, of course, is if we would all focus on changing ourselves, we would change the, the world. world would change. The world would change. And, and so, you know, if this takes dietary discipline, a shift, if it takes, you know, working with healthcare, if it takes exercise as a new and regular part of your life yeah that requires discipline absolutely okay but at the end of the day maybe that is a more impactful thing than preaching to people about reducing your carbon footprint now i'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about reducing our carbon footprint but i will point out the irony of people talking about that who are climbing on intercontinental jets, right? <laughs> or the irony of, of a jet, you know, transport company, yeah. airline, right. who is not going to serve beef on their intercontinental <laughs> flights in the name of. Right. There's a certain amount of hypocrisy Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Um, so all of these things are part of what we should be concerned about. We know that, well, there have been estimates that over, and I think this one came out in 2011, so it's already run more than halfway through or about halfway through. They said by 2030, healthcare costs or chronic disease will have cost the global economy $47 trillion. 
an unfathomable number. Like it's just, it's, what could we do with $47 trillion? Now, all of chronic disease is, you know, I get it. Right, uh, right. I've lost friends who were following a diet that I, and you know, that's life. There's part, part of that is life, absolutely. But we do have some estimate of how much of this burden might be addressed by addressing hyperinsulinemia and chronic, ins you know, and insulin resistance. Okay, so why are we not addressing that? Why are we listening to people who are saying we need to lower the cost of insulin yeah. to address the global burden of sure. type 2 diabetes? Yeah. I'm not talking type 1 diabetes, of course. Of course. Right. On the other it hand, why is lowering the cost to increase the availability the sort of first reaction to a global type 2 diabetes epidemic? Well, because we have these other ideas about, you know, type 2 diabetes is progressive, it's incurable, one yeah, must be reversible, it must be medicated. Well, yeah. we have good news that there are such things as drug-free remission from type 2 diabetes. Oh, it's been shown, it's been shown, I mean, I don't I mean, there are a couple of people from Verda here. Verda's shown that quite a bit. I mean, with, with a high compliance rate in a nutritional study. Talk about sustainability. Yeah. Here are people who are sustaining this lifestyle intervention for five years. Yeah. I yeah. mean, at what point is and it's, it? And it's considered a, a um, highly, uh, what would you call it, you know, strict protocol. It's the ketogenic diet. Well. Know? Right, it's, it's it's too restrictive re by some. By some, right? But there's a high compliance rate for over five years with reversibility in a disease that is considered yeah. irreversible. Yeah, and and meanwhile, I'm looking for information on, you know, global healthcare costs, and up comes an advertisement from a startup company that's saying, yes. okay, one of the things that's that's one impediment to addressing this problem is the fear of needles. And so here's a new drug delivery system for the global type two diabetes population. And I'm going, well, yeah, okay, I get it, but maybe there's another way we could try. Meanwhile, we've got between a quarter and a fifth of children under five being stunted due to a lack of the essential nutrients that are best sourced by animal source foods. We've got something approaching 30, a third of women globally being anemic, again, because of a lack of animal source food. We've got over 65% of children globally that are not getting a meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood during a period of time when the WHO is saying that's the best source of those essential nutrients. So we've got this complete disconnect, and yet, and, and you know, I, one more, <laughs> I've, I will show maps of the world that, that show where, you know, the burden of stunting globally. And not surprisingly, it's heaviest in Africa, Southwest Asia, parts of South America. Then we have another similar global map that shows the burden of um, increased mortality. So this is the percentage of 30-year-olds that will die before they're 70. And not surprisingly, there's amazing coincidence between those two maps. Mm -hmm. Then we have Eat Lancet that comes out with their map of healthiest diets. And what they can't see is the countries that they think are the healthiest diet coincide with the, di the countries with the highest incidence of, of stunting and mortality. There's this cognitive dissonance, this, this disconnect between reality and what they're proposing. And is it just that they're, they're, they're so rigid in their belief? Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. So we could talk about, there's a, there's a, a method of assessing di uh, um, protein quality. It's called DIAS, Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score. It's elegant work, it's expensive work, but what it shows is how much of these indispensable amino acids is actually digestible in a monogastric, like us. Okay, 
Um, well, so we just find the people that are attacking that because they have to. Still, yeah. So, so they that, have, that's, that's the uh, uh, when is a protein or when is a protein not, prote not a protein? When is a protein not a protein? Right, and and you put quotes around the first protein because when you look at a label or table, what's listed as protein there is actually crude protein. It's not the digestible, indispensable amino acids that we need. And, and if we don't get them in the proportion that we need, it doesn't matter if we can absorb them or not. We're not going to be able to utilize them if one of those is limiting. So it's a very complicated thing. The simplest way is to just make sure you take your daily meds, meat, eggs, dairy, seafood. Right. I like that. <laughs> you know, steak a day keeps the doctor away. Yes. I'm just an agronomist, right? Don't take what I say as medical advice, but let's talk about the information that's available, especially in a marketplace where we have these other messages. Here's an example. We have these plant pucks that are being managed. Ma <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're everywhere. And so the way I keep it straight is is impossible has S's in it. That stands for soybeans. Yeah. And then beyond is made with pea protein isolate. Well, pea protein isolate does is not a good source of protein for humans. But it's but pea protein and, and soy are, are are typically promoted as close to a complete protein. Understood. Right? Uh, and, and incorrectly so. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. God bless America. I mean, you know, marketing is marketing. I get it. Um, but it, pea protein, so the, the, there was a study done where they looked at dias for both the impossible and beyond and compared them to ground beef and ground pork. And what they found was the Beyond does not qualify as a good source of protein. The Impossible does, but not necessarily as good as the ground beef or the ground pork. Now, nobody's going to eat those by themselves. And they're going to be part of a meal. Well, a wheat bun is deficient in lysine. And the impossible burger bun puck doesn't have enough lysine to make up for that deficiency. So when you combine them into a meal, they no longer qualify as a good source of protein. Yeah, but that's never told. Understood, and that's not a sound bite, obviously. Yeah. But again, we have these messages and there's information to yeah. help people. Yeah, for sure. You know, a lot of this, you know, it boils down to don't listen to the people that sold you the diet that made you sick in the first place. Uh, and, and so this environmentalist message goes back to the first dietary guidelines, dietary goals actually, and then into the guidelines and to present. So again, the, the secret to enlightenment is to lighten up. Focus on what you can do, what's affordable, because economic stress isn't good for you. And what's available to you in your environment and, you know, what's appropriate. You know, not everybody will choose to eat beef, let alone red meat. Okay, my definitions of the words are, we've got three dietary strategies, carnivore, vegan, omnivore. Okay, whatever animal source food you choose to eat, Wonderful. Okay, I'm, I'm concerned about the vegan. Yep. The rest of it. Good to go. Good to go. Make your best choices. Exactly. So personal responsibility. We could take responsible for our own metabolic health. There, there is. If we all did that, there is a larger impact, and yes. it's it's probably more achievable than ignoring what's going on here and trying to change the world. Yes. Yes. And, you, and then those three pillars you, you talked about can all be affected. If oh, absolutely. We, yeah. What's the societal impact of people's lives oh, being diminished because they had to have a foot amputated? It's huge. What's the economic impact? We, I mean, that's evident. Yeah. 
and and we're not going to solve these challenges until we really take this on board. So in the United States, okay, Brazil, for example, has three times the number of cattle that we do in North America. They produce less beef. Sub-Saharan Africa has like a fifth of the world's cattle, and yet they're essentially not commercialized. So we have this work that needs to be done. I've called it a ruminant revolution. We need to improve the productivity and efficiency of ruminant animal agriculture globally. And then I could go on and bore you with details, but we can't do that until people who have the financial wherewithal, the connections to get behind that kind of effort we had to have a green revolution to avoid starvation for a billion people at a time when that was a quarter of humanity. Well, we now need to move to a better quality diet. As, as I said, you know, global burden of chronic disease is over 70% of deaths globally. Better quality diet less processed food. And the way that it seems like things are going in order to make these changes is more processed foods. Because that's essentially what those pucks you were talking about are. Yeah, clearly that those are not going to be eaten by the majority of humanity. Right. right? That's not what they need. Yeah. They need things like refrigeration. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They need a reliable electrical supply, which is required for refrigeration. They need safe food, right? They need to, they need better chains between producers and marketplace. You know, they need to lower the burden of animal diseases. The, you know, there's, and, and again, these are the sort of things, but when I go to some of these sustainability conversations and they, bring out, and these are serious people doing serious work, showing, for example, that one egg a day can make a measurable difference in the mental development of a child by the time it's nine years old. Okay, that, I mean, stunting is not merely stature, it's cognitive development. So, and yet, they still believe that there's something called too much animal source food in a human's diet. They believe some of these chronic diseases actually come from eating too much animal source food. So we, we have to get that eliminated. And I'm looking for help in that. Because well, I'm just a forage agronomist. What the heck do I know, right? So. Well, I'm glad that we could have this conversation and get this message out. Here, thank you so much.